hello and uh, welcome. Uh, I hope everybody can see me here anyways. Uh, my name is Tyler. I just wanted to welcome everybody here so far uh, to our Build a Tetris game workshop for today. Um, before I get started, I'm just going to ask for a little bit of feedback from uh, everybody. Uh, the chat section is off to the right hand side there. Maybe just let me know if you can see me okay, if you can hear me okay. Um, once I get the confirmation there, I can uh, take a look and, and get things going. Waves, hello. Uh, good, good. You can see me. Perfect. Loud and clear. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So uh, yeah, a couple of things we'll go over for the presentation here today. Um, you know, to get us kind of going, uh, first, I just want to do the AV check, make sure I was good. Um, you'll notice on the right hand side here, you guys are all already interacting in the chat uh, log. Uh, please feel free to do that throughout the entire duration of the presentation. Um, you will notice there's also a questions tab there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if anything um, that you guys want to go over, um, there will be some of us working behind the scenes throughout the uh, actual workshop, answering some of your questions. Uh, for any of the questions that we don't get to during uh, the actual workshop itself, uh, hi, Deja. Uh, Deja. Um, but if you have any uh, questions that we don't get to, uh, just leave them in the questions tab there. Uh, we will try and set aside some time at the very end for a bit of Q&A. Um, so we'll try and get through all of that. Uh, worst case scenario, if there's any questions that anybody posts that we don't get to uh, during the presentation, please do reach out to a team member here. We would be happy to assist any time. Uh, something I will note is that this um, is going to be recorded. So for anybody who is looking to have a copy of this afterwards, uh, please note that it will be recorded and it will be sent out to everybody. I'll note that a few times today here during the presentation. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, no, the, uh, the, the polls tab too, I'm sorry. Uh, there's also a polls tab on the right. Um, after um, Jerry comes up and does his formal presentation, uh, I will drop a poll into the tab and I would encourage everybody to please participate. Uh, obviously it just helps us to um, you know, uh, strengthen our, our workshops and our presentations here for future uh, uh, workshops coming up. So, um, so that is it. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, actually share the screen and get um the presentation portion started here just give me a quick moment here there we go perfect okay so oh. back uh gone to ashes <laughs> can you guys still see me can you hear me okay um this this literally happened the last time that i was doing uh the presentation as well uh if this happens at at all throughout uh, uh during uh, please note that this is my own personal issue I'm, I'm assuming with my laptop here um but last time it only happened once so i'm i'm hoping that this is it um ooh, day on it just said uh you'd message that i froze can anybody still see me right now we're back. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So apologies. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and share the screen here again. Um, if, uh, if anything cuts out here, um, I will be right back and we will certainly figure out the technical issue. But uh, for now, I'm going to attempt to reshare my screen and uh, we will see what happens. There we go. Perfect. Okay. I'm pretty sure it worked well that time. Uh, so uh, this is today's uh, Build a Tetris Game Workshop. <clears throat> Again, I will just uh, re-welcome everybody just because I feel bad that I got kicked out there for a moment. Um, this is me. Uh, my name is Tyler Trapp. Uh, I am an enrollment advisor here at CircuitStream. Uh, I actually come from a background working in hospitality and uh, tourism. I worked there for 10 plus years. Um, also a little bit of an artist, I guess it's self-taught. Um, I, I like to paint, I like to draw. Uh, anything artistic and then uh, more, most recently I've kind of shifted a bit more into digital art uh, and I've been playing with uh, Procreate. So uh, that's me, uh, just a little bit of a bio on me. Uh, Jerry 
is uh, obviously uh, going to be our instructor today uh, for the uh, the workshop, and he's also our head of education here. Uh, Jerry is a game development and AI expert. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience uh, using his skills to create games and expert training and simulations. Uh, so obviously you're gonna hear uh, some more from Jerry here when he comes up on the screen as well. Um, but just for a quick little agenda item, I guess, for today, what we're going to be looking at, uh, we're in the introduction portion here, the 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, once we wrap this up, I'm going to hand it over to Jerry to take over for the actual technical session. Uh, that will be the Tetris game itself. Um, once that's finished, um, I'm going to pop back on and provide some resources and some more uh, information for everybody here. Um, just quick, you know, 10 minutes or so to provide some links and info. Uh, and then once that's finished, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we will definitely set aside some time for a QA. and a So if you have any questions, anything that we haven't gotten to, uh, please do post them off to the right there and we will do our best to go through all of that at the end. Um, so a little bit about uh, Circuit Stream. Uh, we are an educational company. We were founded back in 2015. Uh, our founders just noticed a gap in uh, personalized training and education in the XR industry. Uh, XR just being a fancy umbrella term for extended reality, which covers both AR and VR. Uh, to date, uh, we've actually supported over 40,000 individual learners. Uh, this would be through our courses, through our workshops. Um, and obviously, this is a massive milestone for us here at CircuitStream. Uh, our team, uh, we are located all over the place. Um, our headquarters, as you can see here, is uh, Calgary, Alberta. Um, I am also located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, uh, and the founders are, uh, but you can see based on the map here that our team members are located all over the world. Um, we just come from different backgrounds, you know, um, able to teach folks, I guess, all different skill levels and uh, the value of uh, VR and AR and uh, how to build apps within Unity. Uh, speaking of Unity, uh, we are actually a certified Unity training partner. Uh, so training partners are approved based on their expertise, uh, on their focus, on their education, and their commitment to providing the highest level of training available. Uh, so for, uh, in order for us to be a certified training partner, uh, Circuit Stream with Unity, we would need to meet all of those criteria, uh, which we do. Um, and then at CircuitStream, we also offer uh, industry standard uh, certifications that are tied to international standardization models. Uh, if you're interested in learning any more about these, uh, I do highly recommend that you check out our blog post on the subject. Uh, it is full of information about how it all works and why these certifications are so valuable. Uh, we also have some amazing partnerships with some universities. Um, proud to announce that as of this year, CircuitStream has been partnering with some of the world's most prestigious universities uh, to offer educational programs, our XR development with Unity, and now our international, uh, sorry, interaction design and prototyping uh, are both offered uh, through the continuing education departments and all the institutions that you see here on the screen right now. Uh, it's here. Uh, so Circuit Stream, uh, above all else, is definitely an educational company. Uh, as you can see, we've had the pleasure of working with some of the world's largest and most exciting companies. Uh, given just how quickly uh, VR and AR is accelerating uh, at the moment, the biggest companies and in industries in the world are definitely taking notice and they're innovating with this technology. Uh, honestly, we could probably you know, have three or four of these pages of, of logos that are very recognizable. So this is just a little bit of a snapshot here. Uh, so what is Unity? Uh, what is Unity exactly? Uh, if you've seen this interface, uh, chances are that you are familiar with Unity. Uh, and if you've seen this muffin clicker game specifically on the screen right now, then you've likely already taken our C-sharp um, scripting and fundamentals course. Um, but if not, if you're not familiar with Unity, uh, Unity is a free 3D development engine for building games, simulations, and experiences. Uh, it really is the easiest way to begin making apps and games. Um, Unity's impact globally, um, we know that uh, Unity is currently used to create over 60% of the world's AR and VR content uh, in um, uh, applications. And then the, uh, the global impact is, uh, we have uh, downloaded, yeah, that's right, uh, apps are um, downloaded about 3 billion times monthly, uh, which is insane. Um, and the software is basically borderless uh, and it's currently in use in over 190 countries globally. So this is the reason why it's a uh, top player in the game right now. And then uh, students often ask, you know, how do they bring their ideas to life? Uh, just like anything else, uh, you know, it has to start with just a basic idea. From there, you would build your assets and bring them into Unity, uh, create immersive uh, interaction using scripting, C-sharp coding language. Uh, once you're happy with the build, uh, then you would leverage an SDK, which is Software Development Kit, uh, to ensure that your device uh, target is compatible with your build. 
<clears throat> excuse me. And once you've done that, you can render and publish your app and then you've got it. You've got an app that you would have created right from an idea, uh, built it and then exported it into uh, your, your choice there, whether it's a headset or a, a cell phone, gaming device, whatever the case may be. Um, quickly on some of our academic offerings, uh, I will touch on this a little bit after we uh, go through the formal presentation. Um, but just to quickly note, um, well, actually I'll pop back here. Um, we have academic portfolio, free online workshops and webinars um, like today, and you can um, uh, see all the courses and everything that we offer right on the website as well. Um, our courses here, these are the three main courses that we would have uh, side by side. So we've got the XR development with Unity. Uh, we have our XR interaction design and prototyping. And then we have our more uh, recently launched Unity Developer Bootcamp. Uh, that would be the six month. Uh, the two uh, courses, the XR development on the left and the interaction design in the middle are both 10 week courses. Uh, so we can, oh, I'm just uh, going to note some of the start dates here for the XR development spe uh, specific. Um, so for our university partners, if anybody was looking at the upcoming start dates for the XR development course, uh, it would be March 8th, uh, I believe, for all of the university partners. Yeah, so we've got University of BC, uh, U of T, um, San Diego, and uh, California Riverside. Those are all March 8th, 2022. Uh, so, uh, and then lastly here, uh, before I pass it over to Jerry, um, what are we going to learn here today in the workshop? Uh, you're going to be doing Unity Editor, uh, User Interface, and Main Tools. Uh, you're going to be learning how to deal with prefabs in new objects. Uh, you're going to be learning different types of game objects and how to use them in a project. Uh, you're going to be learning game controls and interactions, and then basic simple scripting and physics. Uh, so we're going to hope that this does not uh, shut down my uh, live stream here again. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Perfect. Okay, good. And I can see the chat now. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I am going to invite uh, Jerry up onto the stage. And uh, Jerry, if you are there, you are welcome to join in. Hey. Awesome. I am. <laughs> Happy Thursday. Um, I can let, let you jump in and formally take over the presentation. And uh, like All I said, right. uh, once Jerry's finished here, I will pop back in and I'll go through a little bit of the info for the courses. All right, great. I'm going to uh, take over here. Hello, everyone. Um, just let me know if you can see me, hear me well. Is it all good? I'm working fine. I was having issues earlier today too. All right, perfect. Nice, all right, cool, 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 cool. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, let me just reorganize my stuff a little bit here doo -doo -doo -doo, and share my correct screen. There we go. Oops, nope, nope, spoiler, spoiler. All right. Perfect, cool. So let's get started. Um, the idea here today is that um, for everyone that is interested in game development or in understanding how Uni works and how from like an idea of a game, we can convert that into something that we can play using Unity and C Sharp. Um, we know that Tetris is, uh, it seems like a simple game, but you're gonna see that there are lots of elements involved in there. So we're gonna be creating the basic, or at least the main, the most important features there. So I'm gonna show you how to create the pieces in Unity, how to make it move sideways, rotate it. Um, some constraints like um, make it not be able to go over the board or on top of other um, other pieces and things like that. And maybe in the end, if we have time, we're gonna do the clear line as well, which is a little bit more complex. So maybe I'll just show you how I read that. And, and go over the details in there. But the main idea here is that um, everyone by the end of this workshop has a good understanding of how Unity works. We're gonna be sharing the complete project with everyone and also the recording. So you can go over it uh, in your own pace later and see how uh, it goes. So some recommendations, some suggestions here for everyone in the audience there so you don't get confused. Um, what I recommend is that uh, you basically try to pay attention to the concepts, like why I'm doing things and how I'm doing them. Uh, the logic, like how I think through, uh, this is what I need to do, and then that's how we're going to be writing that code. Um, so you can understand the process of uh, converting a feature into code. I recommend that you don't try to follow along. That might get you a little bit lost, especially because 
It's a short workshop. We're going to go through things a little bit quickly. So the better is to understand what I'm doing, ask questions in the end, and then later on your own pace, you can rewatch the recording and study the code and the project that we're going to be sharing uh, with everyone. And also, I recommend that everyone add new features later. So um, uh, you can even share them with me. Some people have built some interesting things in the game. So we're going to have access to the project. You can just go over and try to add your own features there. So basically, uh, those are my recommendations. So it works well for everyone. And uh, now, without further ado, let's start uh, by creating our new uh, project in Unity. So um, if you have Unity downloaded, you're probably going to have something like this, which is the Unity Hub. They recently changed it. So maybe you have a version that is slightly different. It looks a little bit different. So if that's the case, uh, no worries. It's not going to be super, super different. But uh, what we need to do here is basically create a project. So uh, here in the Unity Hub, we have a couple of options. So the first one is all of the projects that we have, projects that you already created in the past. If you have never done any projects in Unity, it's going to be empty. Uh, we can go to installs to add different versions of Unity. So this is something very, very useful as well. Uh, sometimes uh, we have like legacy projects that are in different versions. So it's uh, useful to keep multiple versions installed. Today, I'm going to be using 2020 uh, LTS, which stands by long-term support. So that's my recommendation. If you have a different version, that's all right. You can use any version. Um, it's going to be basically the same. Uh, for for what we're going to be building today, and um, and and yeah, there are a couple other resources here that are interesting as well. Some tutorials, workshops that you can check. But uh, let's start by creating our project. So I'm going to go here on the projects tab and click on new project. Uh, this gives me a bunch of different templates. Um, they are basically like uh, <clears throat> boilerplates for creating different types of projects. We're going to go with the simplest one. So I'm going to select here core and select 3D core. If you still have the old version of the hub, it's going to be organized a little bit different. Just select 3D. It's going to be like a box that says 3D and that's it. So you don't need to select any different template. Uh, then you can select where you want it to go and what is the name of this project. So I'm just going to call it uh, Tetris Oops. Workshop. And you can select where you want to save this project on your disk. So I'm not going to change anything and just hit click create project. So this is going to create a new project for us, which is brand, brand new, and then open that in Unity. Usually it takes one minute or two for Unity to process um, the project, create the assets, and create all of the files that it needs. So let's just take a moment here for this thing to finish creating. Usually it's not that bad. Let's see how it goes. So while this thing imports, let me see the chat here. Check it out. Okay. All right. There we go. Here we are. So this is what I'm looking for. Here we have Unity. If you have never seen Unity before, this is how it looks like. So basically, we have a couple of panels. All of the panels, um, they are floating. So we can like drag them and organize them in different ways. So if you don't see exactly what I'm seeing here, it's all right. It's not a problem. Basically, uh, we can customize the way we prefer to work with Unity. So let's understand or let's see here what are the main uh, panels and what they do and uh, what we use them for. So <clears throat> the first one, uh, which is one of the most important here, is what we call the scene. So the scene is basically our uh, world. It's where we are going to edit our stuff. So every 3D object um, that you create, it, you're going to be adding them to the scene. So the scene is basically your uh, canvas. You're going to be creating everything here. Uh, on the right, I have the game. So the game is basically like a snapshot of the scene. So the scene can be infinite. It can be super huge. But the game is basically what the user is going to see in the end. So it's what we're going to be rendering to the user. It's just like a viewport. It's just a small portion of the scene. And it's determined by the camera. So it's basically what the camera sees. 
uh, every single gaming unit that we create uh, needs to have a camera. If we don't have a camera, we don't see anything. So basically the camera is gonna represent the eyes of the player or the user there. So that's what we need to have here. So in the scene, I have my entire, uh, all of the components, my level, everything on the game, only what the user sees. Here on the left, I have the hierarchy. The hierarchy is basically uh, another way of representing the scene, but it's not visual, it's hierarchical. So everything that exists in my scene also exists in the hierarchy. So I have a camera, this camera is somewhere in the scene. This directional light is somewhere in the scene. So basically the scene and the hierarchy, they are the same thing represented in different ways. If I select something in my hierarchy, for example, my camera or my directional light, I can see the properties of those objects here in the right in this panel that we call the inspector. So the inspector basically shows me properties about my object. So if I select the camera, where it is, what is the rotation, information about what this camera can see, how long it goes and things like that. If I select my light, same thing. So I have the position, I have the rotation, uh, where it is in the word basically. And I also have properties uh, that are uh, relative to this light. For example, the color, intensity and things like that. So every object in Unity is called a game object. So everything that exists in the scene is a game object. And what makes one object different from the other is what we call components. So every single object is gonna be a transform or is gonna have a transport, uh, transform component that determines position and rotation and scale. So that's mandatory. No object can exist without a position, rotation and scale, but they have different components. For example, the camera has this camera component and the light has this light components. So that's what makes objects different in our uh, hierarchy in our game. And we're gonna leverage those concepts a lot, like we're gonna be using components and game objects to create our uh, 3D spaces there. All right, that's it. Uh, here on the bottom, I have another one which is important, which is basically the project. So the project is a tab, it's basically like our file system for Unity. So every single file that I have, scripts, 3D models, materials, everything, they're gonna be in the project, even if I'm not using them, uh, them in the scene. So it's basically like everything that I have available to use in my project. So those are the main panels, the main components in Unity. There are a bunch more, uh, but let's just uh, stick to those ones because those are the ones that are more important. We're gonna be using them most of the time. All right, so now let's start by uh, creating things in our scene that are gonna help us to, uh, to create this Tetris game. So we're gonna be creating the pieces or none of, none, none of blocks, none of grams. They have special, like they have a name, but I can't remember. I'm just gonna call them pieces or blocks. And we're gonna be creating uh, them here in the scene. So one thing that we can notice is that in Unity we have this grid and this grid is gonna help us to align our objects. We're gonna count on this grid a lot. So if you don't see this grid, here in the scene view, there is this option that says Z, toggle visibility of the grid here, this option right here. You can enable or disable the grid. You can also enable grid in different axes, um, but that's it. So if you don't see it, you can basically enable the grid in Z. All right. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, basically I want to have something to represent the playable area. So I'm gonna be representing uh, the background of my Tetris game. So let me see um, if I can see somewhere here. Um, no, I don't think I have a good representation. We're gonna be creating something that represents this uh, background. So for that, uh, we can use uh, 3D objects. We're gonna be only working with 3D objects in Unity that we call primitives. They're basically um, simple shapes. So they can be spheres, cubes, and things like that. Uh, to draw my background, I'm gonna be using a cube. So I will right click here in the hierarchy. If you wanna create a new object, we're gonna do that in the hierarchy. So we can right click, go to 3D object, and here we have all of our primitives. We have like cubes, spheres, uh, cylinders, and things like that. So I'm gonna be creating a cube. So I created a cube. 
In Unity, when we create an object, uh, it's gonna be in uh, any position there, like a random position. We can reposition that. We're gonna do that uh, later. If we wanna focus on the object, say for example, I have many objects and they are far away. I don't know where they are. We can select an object and press the F key. So it's gonna focus on that specific object. So here we can see that I have my object. This object is pretty uh, small. It's just basically, um, basically here. I wanted to uh, determine my play area. So I'm gonna make it bigger. I'm gonna make it, uh, if I select my cube, we can go here in the inspector and determine the dimensions that we wanted to have. So let's say, for example, I want it to be like 10 meters wide in Unity. The default uh, Unity is meters. So every time that, uh, Every time that I um, that I change the values here, I am talking in meters. So I saw a question there, how did I create the object? You're gonna right click on the hierarchy. So in the hierarchy here, you right click and then you go to 3D object. And here you have some options. What I did was create um, a cube. So I created this cube here and I would change the dimension. So I want it to be 10 by 20. So that's basically uh, my play area. This is gonna just represent my play area. It's gonna basically be uh, where my blocks can be. And uh, later we're gonna calculate that we don't want it to go um, outside of this box here. So this box is gonna be uh, useful for us. Another thing, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this cube was created in a random position. So we can see here that is in 19 minus three minus four. I will make it zero, 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 just to standardize things. So it's a lot easier to think uh, when we have things aligned to the zero, zero, zero. So notice that when I select this cube, we're gonna have the zero, zero, zero in the center of this cube. Basically the center is zero, zero, zero. So everything below is gonna be, uh, gonna be a negative value and everything above is gonna be a positive value. Uh, to make it a little bit easier, uh, same with the X here. So everything that is to the left is gonna be in a negative position. Everything that is in the right is gonna be in a positive uh, position. Uh, one thing that we can do to simplify our life and only deal with positive values is to, instead of align the zero, zero, zero with the center, is to align the zero, zero, zero with this corner here. Uh, so everything to the right is going to be positive. Everything to the top is going to be also positive. So the easiest way to do that is just move this cube a little bit. So instead of making it uh, starting in the zero, zero, I'm going to make it start in five, which is basically um, a half of uh, the dimension here, a half of the 10. And... I will uh, move it here to 10. So now basically we can see that my zero zero is on the center, but the zero zero of the world is on this uh, corner here. So now it's gonna make our life a little bit easier. Every time that uh, I am, uh, I wanna see for example, if this object is on the bottom uh, or if it's in the left, it's always zero zero. So now my zero zero is here. As it moves to the right, it's gonna be positive. As it moves to the top, is gonna also be positive, All right? So this is basically our uh, world. We're gonna start from here. One thing that is um, important to notice here is that my cube is a little bit weird in the game. So in the scene, it seems all right. It's aligned to the grid and I can see it and everything. But here in the scene, it's a little bit weird. This is because remember that I mentioned uh, the game is basically what the user is going to see, and it's basically what the camera can see. So our camera, or my camera here, it is in a weird position. It's basically in a weird position. So what we can do is basically just reposition that. So I can just like select my camera and move it around until I am satisfied with how it looks in the game. So basically now, I can see that is a little bit more centralized. Of course, well, we can calculate and see the best position here, but just using 
my uh, gut feelings here, I'm going to position that around here. One thing that we can see is that the camera can see uh, what we call a skybox, which is basically like the simulation of the sky that or, or there. If we are making a 3D game where the player or the user can walk around, it makes sense to see a, like a sky or something like that. But in our Tetris game here, it's basically like a 2D game. We are not going to move around. So we can change how we look by changing some properties on the camera. So here in the camera, where we have this clear flag to skybox, basically what we're seeing or what we're saying is that the camera is going to see up all the way to the skybox. We can select a solid color, and then it's gonna like, instead of render the skybox on the horizon, it's gonna just render any color, and then you can choose which color you want. So if you want a black or white or whatever, you can just choose that. So let me make it black so I can see it in contrast with the grid. If I wanna make this a little bit bigger, I can just select my camera, and move the camera forward a little bit. So we can just basically play around with the position of the camera here. Good, so that's, so that's it. That's the first part. We basically have our uh, nice, neat uh, background here, and it's aligned to the zero, zero, which is gonna make our life a lot easier to play with. All good, all cool. It's making sense. Just use thumbs up there if it's making sense. Thumbs down if it's not making sense. <laughs> it is? Nice. Perfect. Cool. Great, great. So now what we need to do is, uh, well, we need to create, I don't know why my browser doesn't want to open. But now we need to create our blocks, right? We need to basically create our blocks there. One thing that I want everyone to notice here is that in the Tetris game, all of those blocks, they have specific pivot points. Basically when they rotate, they rotate around a specific pivot. So we can see here that this block, and this is called uh, Hero, they have names. If you search like in the, Tetris uh, wikis, you're gonna see that they have specific names. I don't know all of them, can remember, but I remember this one is, I think this is Mashboy and this is Hero. They have nice names, but um, look that they have like specific pivot points that are used to rotate them around. So here in the uh, in this Smashboy or this solid block guy, he has basically the pivot point in the center. So this is the easiest one to, to build. We're gonna build that. But this one here has a pivot uh, on the top. So we're gonna need to take that, oops. We're gonna need to take that into consideration. So let's start creating our blocks. We're gonna do that based on cubes. So uh, for this guy here, I'm gonna be using like one, two, three cubes. For this one here, I'm gonna be using one, two, three, four cubes. So we're gonna basically build them out of cubes. And then later you can create your own blocks as well. So let's start with the simplest one, which is basically the, the smash, the smash boy, the one we has like four uh, different cubes. So I'm gonna just find any position here and um, I will create it. So um, the way I'm gonna do it is, uh, well, if I just create like four cubes, so let me do something here. I'm going to be creating, uh, let me rename this one first. This is my background. So we don't confuse, uh, the cubes. If you want to rename an object, you can right click and select rename, or you can press F2. It's gonna, uh, rename that. If you're on a Mac, I think it's command R, but can remember. So just right click, um, and rename, it's gonna go there. So if I just create here, for example, like I'm gonna be creating a cube here and focus on that cube. And then I have another one and another one, and I'm gonna compose them uh, so they make the blocks. So let me create another one here. Here we're gonna have a problem because uh, all of them should move together, right? Even though they have like different pieces, 
they are still one thing. If I just move it uh, like one by one, they're going to break apart. So that's not what I want to do. So for that, we're going to uh, do something a little bit different and we're going to uh, do what we call a hierarchy. We actually use the hierarchy uh, for something. So this, the way this, or the reason why this thing is called a hierarchy is because one object can control another one uh, based on its parent and child relationship. So we can make one object be a parent or a child of another object. And that's why we call this a hierarchy. So the way we're going to be doing it is I will right click and I will create an empty game object. So what's an empty game object? It's basically a game object that we cannot see. The only thing it has is a position, rotation, and scale. It has a transform component. It only has position, rotation, and scale. It doesn't have anything else. Uh, so usually we use game objects like that just to hold a hierarchy. So I'm going to call this, oops, I'm going to call this uh, smash boy. And I will add that to the zero, zero, zero position just to make our life a little bit easier here. So right now it's here in the zero, zero, zero position, but it's completely empty uh, because it's an empty game object. So what I will do is I will create four cubes as children of this specific game object. So there are two ways of doing that. If you already have a cube like this, for example, you can drag it to the smash by, uh, and then it becomes a child. So if I just drag it, you can see it becomes a child. We can tell that based on the folder structure here. So that means if I move the smash boy, it also moves the cube because the parent always drives the, child, uh, the children uh, regarding to position, rotation, and scale. If I move the cube, it doesn't move the parent, but if I move the parent, it moves the cube. Another thing that is important to notice here is that if I move this smash boy, so I can move the parent, we can see that the position changed here. But in the cube, this position didn't change. It's still zero because this position is relative to where the parent is. So every time that I'm dealing with transforms or transformations in a child object, this position, rotation, and scale is relative to the parent. So we need to take that into consideration. All right. So when I say zero, 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 it's not the global zero, zero, zero in the world. It's actually zero, zero, zero relative to where the parent is. So this is going to be important. All right. So I created this cube here. And now, basically, I want to align it to, uh, to the corners. I want to make like a big box. Right, I want to make like a big uh, smash boy here that has like four tiles. So I can basically move this guy up and to the side. Easiest way to do that is instead of trying to do that manually is using the values. So if this guy is one by one by one, I can move it minus 0.5 and 0.5. So I know that it's perfectly aligned. Now I'm going to duplicate this. And this one is going to stand here. So it's going to be minus 0.52, right? Like minus 0.5 to the left, but minus 0.5 down. And I'll duplicate it once more and move it to this side. So it's going to be 0.5 and minus 0.5. And the last one that is going to take this spot here is going to be 0.5 and 0.5. Oops, not 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So now if I move my Smash Boy, we're going to see that it's perfectly aligned there. And all of my cubes are in a perfect shape. Nice. One thing that we want to do is change the color of this cube as well, because we want it to look better, to look different. So uh, in Unity, uh, the responsible, the component responsible for how an object looks like is called a renderer. So if we select, for example, this is mesh boy because it's an empty, it doesn't have a render. That's why we don't see it. If I select any of those cubes, they're going to have something called a mesh renderer. So this is basically something that tells that this should draw a cube. 
One of the properties of this component is a material. So we can see here that we have a list of materials. Uh, every object uses a material by default, which is the default material here. And a material is basically oops, what tells an object how it should look like. Should it be pink uh, or green or blue? Should it be transparent, opaque, react to the light or not? So those are properties of the material. For us to create a material, so let's make this guy, what is the color he has here? So it's yellow. Let's create a new material. So I'll right click, create, and then we're gonna go on material. Notice how different the process is here. When we want to create an object, we go directly to the hierarchy. So we create uh, an object from here. Now the material, it doesn't exist alone. It needs to be attached to something. So we call that an asset. That's why we're gonna be call, uh, creating it here in our project, in the assets of our project. So I right click, create, and then we're gonna go to a uh, material and I'll call it yellow. So there are lots of properties for materials to make it look different. You can make it look like metal, gold, water, um, grass, whatever. I will for now just make it yellow. So I will click here on the albedo property, which basically determines how it reflects light. So how it looked like in terms of color. And I'm gonna select something yellowish here. And now I can just drag it to every single cube. Why I don't see the last one. Uh, why I can't, oh there. So because it's overlapping with this, Unity is having a hard time. So let me move it a little bit. Oh, it was yellow already. It's just because it's behind the other one. It's just like behind the other, uh, the other cube. All right. So here we have our uh, smash point, and it looks really good. Another concept in Unity, and this is gonna be super, super useful. Uh, we need to create this many times, right? For people that knows how Tetris uh, works, every time that you use a piece, it's gonna generate another one and another one, and they are random. So we're gonna be creating different instances of this Smash Boy over time, right? So uh, to allow that, Unity has a concept that is called prefab. So a prefab is basically an object um, so a prefab is basically an object that uh, we can replicate, that we can recreate many times. So I'm going to show you how to create an object, but that just, let me just uh, answer James here. Does someone have the position as before? Okay, so the positions here are, oops, the one on the left, minus 5 and 0.5. The other one is minus 5, minus 5. The other one is... 0.5 and minus 0.5, and the last one is 0.5 and 0.5. So all of them are gonna be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. We're gonna alternate the sinus, and it's intuitive. So if you wanna make it go left, it's gonna be minus 0 0.5. If you wanna, if you wanna, if you want to go, make it go up, it's gonna be 0.5 in y. So basically, uh, the y-axis grows uh, up, and the x-axis grow to the right. So you can use that uh, logic to derive the other positions there. But basically, they are variations of half of the dimension. Does that make sense? So with that, you can basically position them. Cool, you're welcome. Great, so let's get back to the prefab here. How do I make this become a prefab? So in Unity, it's very simple, very intuitive. We just need to drag what we want to become a prefab from the hierarchy to the project. So we're gonna drag the Smash Boy from the hierarchy to the project. So now look how it's blue. Everything that we have here in blue, uh, it's just an indication that this thing is uh, a, um, a prefab, an instance of a prefab. So if I delete this, I can just drag back from my folder prefabs to here. So now it's basically like something that we can reuse, something that we can reuse. So I can drag it 
and create as many as I want. That's basically how prefabs work. So now before we get into C sharp coding, let's make one more because this mesh boy, it's not that fun because it's hard to see if rotate, it rotating because it rotates around the center and it's a regular shape. So let's make the hero. Let's make the hero so we can write some code and see how we can uh, make that code uh, work. So I will use the same process. I will right click, create an empty. I'll call this guy a hero. Uh, the hero is basically this one here. Uh, oops, no, this one here. And it's composed of uh, one, two, three cubes. Actually, it's not three, it's, a, it's also four. Three is gonna be short. So yeah, it's gonna be also four. Just they're gonna have some different uh, positions there. So let's do it. I will right click here and I will create. Uh, so first, let me make sure this is on the zero zero. So it's going to be easier for us. And I will create four cubes here. So I'll right click, create a cube. And then we can start positioning those cubes. So the first one, I want it to go all the way to the left. So I'm going to use here a minus 1.5 and a minus 0.5. Because I want to have one, two, three, four. So this one is going to be right here. The next one is going to be here. So it's going to be minus 0.5 and minus 0.5. The next one goes here. So it's going to be 0.5 and minus 0.5. And the next one goes here, which is 1.5 and minus 0.5. Why did I use minus 0.5 in Y here? Because I want the pivot point to be on the top as it is in the pivot here for the image. The, the pivot point is on the top. If I wanted it to be on the bottom, I could have used, oops, I could have used uh, 0.5 positive. So I will use uh, minus 0.5 here. So in this case, all of them have uh, minus 0.5 in Y, so the pivot moves uh, to the top and uh, the X is gonna move from minus 0.5 until it is 1.5. So we can have all of the cubes here. Uh, so Joshua, are you sure here is four blocks or is it three blocks? Um, I think it doesn't make a huge difference. I think it is four. Let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two. I think all of them have four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, all of the blocks have four. They're just uh, organized in different ways. So this is four, this is four. I think all of them have four. One, two, three, four. All of them are four. Yeah, they're, they're just organized in different ways. And here, if you want to give it a color, and I think the color there was blue, let me see. The color there was blue, yes. No, no, it was not blue. Uh, yeah, it was like a light blue. We see on, yeah, that's the, that's the name. So we can create a new uh, material. So I'm gonna right click here and create a new material and I'll call it Cyan, and then I will select it uh, based on my eye here. Of course, it's not gonna be perfect, um, but it's not a big deal. And then I can drag it as we did to each one of the, um, the cubes in there. And we also wanna make this a prefab. So I'm gonna click this guy or select the hero here and drag it to the project. So now I have two prefabs, one for the Smash Boy and one for the hero. And I can create as many instances of this prefab as I want. So basically that's how it's going to work. All right, so let's keep just one here in the scene for now so we can see working with the code. I will uh, just edit here on two and seven, and this doesn't matter. So I just added one guy here. 
uh, so we can start now with the logic. So basically, this is the process for you to create things in Unity. You're going to be using hierarchies. You're going to be using transformations, rotating things, moving things around. You can create different primitives. You can import modules, add materials to them. But basically, that's the basis for uh, creating uh, uh, your scene in there. So now, because we want to actually uh, uh, make it move, uh, and create our code here, we're going to need to write some C-sharp scripting. And uh, every time that we want to add behavior to our, um, to our, uh, to our games and to our, uh, well, uh, characters or whatever, we need to create C-sharp script. So how do I do that? I'm going to create one script here that I will call piece. So here in our project, the same way, way we used to create, uh, a material, we're going to now create a different type of asset with is a C sharp script. So I'll right click, create, and then C sharp script. So let me repeat that. We right click, create, and then C sharp script, and we can give it a name. So I'll call this one piece. That's basically it. One thing that is important to notice is that every script that we create becomes a different component. Every script that we create becomes a different component. So uh, as we have here just the transform, it means that I can only uh, change position and rotation for this um, for this component, position, rotation, and scale, actually. But I can drag the piece of script that we have just created. And now my prefab has another component there is a C-sharp script called piece. So every C-sharp script that we create also becomes a new component. One thing that we can uh, notice here is that this prefab now, uh, it has this plus sign or something like that. What this, noted, uh, what this like um, uh, says in Unity or with means in Unity is basically that this particular instance of uh, hero is different from the others. If I just bring a new hero here, it doesn't have the script. That's because we didn't add this script to the prefab, which is basically a template that is cloned, but we added that to this specific instance. So it's easy to fix that. We just click on overrides here. It's going to show me what is different. And then I have two options, revert, which is going to remove the component because it doesn't exist on the prefab or apply, which is going to add this to the prefab. So I'm going to click on apply. Now, if I bring no other heroes here, all of them are going to have the script. And this is very, very useful because, um, oops, it is very useful because now every time that I create a new one, it's going to look exactly uh, the way I want it to look like, and it's going to have the script there as well. So that's how a prefab work. Good. I missed how making it a prefab. Okay. So to make that a prefab, I can show that again, definitely. So let me do that again. Let me uh, pretend this is not a prefab. How do I break? Uh, I don't have the option to break, prefab, unpack completely. Okay. So let's say, for example, my uh, hero is not a prefab. It's just this way, right? You created it and it's not blue. It doesn't look like um, a prefab. So if it's just like gray, it means it's not a prefab. The way we make it to a prefab is we click on it and we drag it to anywhere in the project tab. So it just becomes a prefab. That's basically how it goes. So now it's going to be blue. And because it's blue, it means it is a prefab. It's an instance of a prefab. That's how it goes. All right. Right, right, take and drag, yeah, exactly, that's it, that's it. That's how you create a prefab. Now, how did I add the script? So I will select my hero here. It is an instance of a prefab because it's blue. I will drag the script from the project to 
the hierarchy or to the inspector. So I have the hero selected. I just grab the script and drag it here. So now I added this just to this instance of the prefab, but I want all of them to have the same script. So here on the top where it says overrides, I'm gonna right click here and click on apply all. So apply all is gonna take the changes that only exist in this prefab and apply that to, or, or better saying, that only exists in this instance and it's gonna apply that to the template, to the model. So I'm gonna click on apply all. That's how we did it. All right, you're welcome. So now let's move forward. I will open the, the script and we're gonna write some code in here. That's what we're looking for. I want to write some coding. Um, let's first see how the structure of a script looks like. So every time that you open a script in Unity, it's gonna look something like this. So uh, there are some musings here, which basically things that we are importing. Uh, every script is considered a class in C Sharp, which means you can reuse that. So I can have as many pieces as I want and all of them are gonna do the same behavior. Um, and then we can see here that we have two functions. So a function is basically a group of instructions that we wanna give uh, to the engine to execute. So those are very important. The start one is a function that is automatically called in every object that has this script or has this script as soon as we hit play and it's called only once. So the start is called only once as soon as we hit play. And the update is called every frame. So if my application is running at, at 30 frames per second, everything that I write here is gonna be executed 30 times per second. So why do I use the start? I use the start when I wanna initialize values, I wanna pre-calculate stuff. We do that in the start. And why do I use the update? I use the update when I wanna check things or calculate things ongoing. So for example, I, um, in the Tetris game, we can press right and left to move the object, right? So I need to check if the user is pressing any button every single uh, frame. I need to check that every time. Why? Because if I don't do it uh, in the update, I might miss the moment where the user pressed the button. So if I check, for example, if the user pressed the button in the start, it only checks once where if I test that in the update, it checks every frame. So we're gonna be uh, relying heavily on the update function today uh, so we can have our um, we can have our code running there. So let's get started and let's uh, uh, let's start with the rotation. So I want to rotate this object uh, every time that I press the up uh, Key. So in Tetris, we cannot make the objects move up. So we're gonna use the up arrow to make it rotate. So basically, uh, we need to write some stuff here. We need to write some code. I need to check a condition. Is the user pressing a button? So every time that I check if a condition is true or if this condition is false, we're gonna use an if statement. So an if statement basically checks, is this true, is this false? We need to add here what is the condition, which is basically uh, what I wanna evaluate. In this case, I wanna check if the button is being pressed, the up button is being pressed. So I'm gonna use the input class in Unity, dot get uh, key up, or better saying down. That key down is gonna give me true if the user is pressing a certain key and false if the user is not pressing that key. And I need to tell which key I'm looking for. So in this case, it's gonna be a key code dot arrow up or up arrow. So this is how a if statement looks like. Right now, every single update or every single frame, I'm gonna check, is the user pressing uh, up, up arrow? Yes, execute what is here. No, doesn't execute anything. So that's how a NIF statement or a NIF block works. We use the curly braces to determine uh, the limitations, like uh, everything that I write 
in between those braces here are going to be executed only if this condition is true. That's basically the first thing that we want to do here. Another thing that we want to do now that we know the key is being pressed is to rotate our object, right? So to rotate our object, we're going to use the transform component. We can see here that the transform component has position, rotation, and scale. So every time that we want to change any of those values by a code for rotation, position, or scale, we're going to use the transform component. So I'm going to say transform dot, and then Unity gives us lots of different things here. So we have, for example, the position, we have the rotation, uh, we have the scale, and we also have some useful functions. For example, one function called um, rotate, um, one function called rotate. This function rotate basically takes uh, a, a vector with Euler angle. So actually um, how many degrees in X, Y, and Z and uh, a space if it's relative to uh, the global space or the local space. Um, but we don't uh, even need to use that if you don't want to. So basically, we need to uh, make it rotate here, right? So we need to pass the parameters. So when we call a function, we need to pass the parameters. There are many different ways to call a single function in C Sharp. That's called override. So we can see here, there are six different ways of calling this rotate function. And they basically do the same thing, but with different parameters. So I can say, for example, angle in X, angle in Y, angle in Z, or I can say, an axis and a space, or I can say uh, a vector tree with three uh, degrees. So basically there are many different ways of doing that. Um, what I wanna do here is basically make sure it's gonna rotate around the Z axis. So if we look here, every time that I rotate, it's gonna rotate this way, right? So we can see that it rotates around the Z axis. So basically, the Z axis in Unity is called the forward axis. So we can say here, uh, vector tree dot uh, forward, which is basically the Z axis, and then how many degrees we want to rotate. So what I'm saying here is, every frame I'm going to check, is the user pressing the key, uh, the up arrow key? Yes rotate this transform 90 degrees around the Z axis. So that's basically what we have here. Pretty simple. And we're going to be using this structure for moving left and right and things like that too. Make sense? Good. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Yep. Nice. So let's test it. It should work out of the box now. If I just go back to Unity, if Unity allows me to, there we go. I'm going to hit play. And then here, every time that I press up, look at that. Ooh, it just rotates. And that's what we want. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, there we go. Yep, yep, cool. Didn't seem, didn't seem it was on the same pivot point. Didn't seem it was the same pivot point. Let's check that. Let's try to check that. Actually, it is. Look at the pivot point. It doesn't change. Can you see it? If you see it on the, on the left, it's rotating around the pivot point. Yeah, it's hard to tell, but if you actually inspect, it actually does that. How would you move it out? So it appears the center is the same. Ah, that's a good question. 
Well, there are many different ways of doing that. One thing that you can do right now, we are just like rotating 90 degrees in one frame. So it can cause like a weird sensation. What you can do is use linear interpolation to delay this rotation a little bit. So it doesn't move uh, directly. But I think Tetris does exactly the way it is here. Like it's very tough, but I don't know. I would use like linear interpolation just to move it or to, to rotate it in a better way. Boom. So let's move forward here. So we have time to go over the, the, the important stuff. Um, that's it. So this is going to make it move left and right. Oh, it's going to make it rotate. Now we want to make it move left and right. So it's going to be very, very, very similar. Uh, for us to move right, we just need to press the right key. So I'm going to check if input dot get key down, same function. But here now, instead of being the key code up arrow, it's going to be the key code dot right arrow. And then instead of moving it um, in the forward axis, we're going to be moving it in the right axis. So here I'm going to use a transform dot translate instead of rotate. Now I want to translate again for the translate. There are many different ways of calling that function. We can pass uh, X, Y, and Z. We can pass uh, a vector, we can pass many different ways. So I want to move it right. So I'm going to use the vector tree dot right. Vector tree dot right is basically uh, the X axis, just represents X. We can see it's one, zero, zero. It's one in, um, in X, zero in Y, and zero in Z. And that's basically it. This should work already. The thing is, because we are rotating the object, the uh, the space, the transformation space is going to change, right? So we want to specify that we want to uh, rotate it always relative to the word uh, X, not the object X, because the object X is going to change as it moves or as it rotates. So we just specify uh, translated one unity in uh, the X uh, axis or the right axis uh, relative to the world space. So this is going to allow me to every time that I press right, it's going to move one unity to the right. So now I can rotate and move to the right. Um, oh, Elias, that's a, that's a good question. Like, wonder if you change the parent center, it could uh, uh, also accomplish it. No, because in the Tetris, for Tetris to play to work, uh, because of the conditions and how the game goes, this is the pivot. So it does rotate around this pivot. If you make it rotate around the center, you're gonna change the game. It's okay, you can do it, but you're gonna change the game. So this is how the original one works. It basically uses those specific um pivots so you could change the pivot and it just it's just a, like it's not gonna work by the game but it, it shouldn't be a big of a problem nice so now i have this if i press up it rotates and if i press right it also moves right if I want to make it move left, it's going to be very similar to this. So I will just copy and paste, and I will make some edits. So the first one, instead of right arrow, it's going to be actually left arrow. And instead of right, it's going to be left. So if the user presses the left arrow, it moves one unity because this is one uh, minus one zero zero so it moves to the left and now if i go back to unity and test it look at how it going to work i can now move right left and i can rotate we have no limits here nothing is preventing it from 
moving left or right, we are going to add it. But right now, that's it. We can move uh, both sides. Can you restate why you use world for the right? Uh, ah, yes, I can. So here, this is just a rotation, right? It is basically rotating around the center. I don't care what the word is. I want just to rotate around the center of the object. Let me show you something. I'm going to remove it from the right. So now I'm not moving uh, in the word space anymore. Look at that. It's going to cause a very interesting behavior. So when I hit play, if I don't rotate my object and I move, it moves fine. But now I rotate it. Now, when I try to move right, it actually moves up because in this specific object, because it, was, it is rotated, uh, now the forward of this object is not pointing forward in the world anymore. It's pointing up because this object rotated. So the forward moves based on how I am uh, rotating this object. So it's basically like, um, I don't know, like, let me, I have this pen here. So this is the forward. If I rotate it, now the forward's pointing down. So basically I move the local forward as I rotate the object. That's why we cannot move without specifying that it needs to move in the world right. So it works. Anyways, does this make sense? Perfect. Cool. Nice. So uh, another thing that we need to do here in Tetris, the blocks, they move down every, every determined amount of time. Uh, they just move down alone, right? So we need to make sure it moves down uh at a certain uh amount of time so the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna count time so i'm gonna create here two things that we call variable so a variable is basically something that we can change the value so i'm gonna be creating two variables here one is basically um uh, how how many seconds i want the block to wait until it moves down so i'm gonna create a public float uh fall time here equals to one so when we're creating variables in c sharp we need to determine a couple of things so the first one is the visibility if it's public or private uh which determines if it's going to be accessible outside of the script or not so public means it is accessible outside of the script then we have the type which is basically which type of variable I want is it a text is this a number is this a boolean that can be true or false so in our case here, a float means that it can be like a number that's not a whole number. So it could be, for example, 1.5, or it could be 1.6, or it could be one. Uh, if I make it an int, it can only be one, two, three, four, or zero, minus one, but never have like a floating point. So uh, that's a difference between the types. So I have this variable here. I will also create another variable that I'll call a uh, time count. And I will call this, or I will say this is zero. So basically, what I want to do is, every time that this time count reaches one, it means that I counted one second. So this starts at zero, go into one second, goes back to zero, go into one second, goes back to zero, go into one second. So that's basically how we're going to be doing. This never changes. This changes between zero and one in small steps. We're going to do that here in the update function because the update function runs every frame. So basically, what I'm going to do here is my time count, which starts at zero, every frame it's equals to my time count plus time dot delta time. So what is time dot delta time? It's basically how many uh, milliseconds passed since the last frame. So say, for example, I am in the first frame, my time count is zero, and my data time is zero because it's the first time the update is being executed. So this is going to be zero. In the next frame, say, for example, it took like 100 milliseconds. This is going to be zero plus 100 milliseconds. So now my time count is 100 milliseconds. 
Next frame, say for example, we took like 200 milliseconds. This is now 100 because of the previous execution. So it's gonna be 100 plus 200, which is 300 milliseconds. And it's gonna go over and over and over until it is one, because one is basically our condition here. So what I wanna do is if my time count is greater than or equals to my fault time, it means that one second or a little bit more than one second has passed. So I can reset my time count to zero again. So this is gonna be repeating. Every time that this reads one, it goes back to zero. Reads one, goes back to zero. So this is a good way to time or to count uh, how many time passed. Every time that this amount of time passed, I wanna make my block go down. So I'm gonna use the transform.translate, same function that we used before. Now I want to make it go down. So I'm gonna use a vector tree dot, oops, vector tree dot down. And I will use the space dot word. So this is basically the same thing that we are doing here, but here we are doing that based on the user pressing a key. Here, we're doing it based on time. So every interval of time, we make this go down. Let's test it and see how it looks like. Go, go, go. Let's see if it works. There you go. So every second, every second it goes down one unit. Every second it goes down one unit. If we select our here, here and check, it goes from zero into one, from zero into one, from zero into one. So that's how we're gonna make it uh, fall every one second. If we wanna make it fall every two seconds, we can just change the fall time. And now it's gonna go up to two seconds. So we can basically play around with the time we want to wait before it falls. Uh, default is a unit of one, correct? Yes. So the default uh, fault time is one. And also the move, the move um, it also moves one unity by one unity because this left or this down here, they are all represented in uh, one, units of one. So here it's minus one. If you wanna make it go down faster, or not faster, but like more units at a time, which doesn't make sense in this game, you can just multiply this by, this by a number. So it's gonna like, it's gonna uh, skip pieces in the grid. It doesn't make sense in the game. All good. So now, uh, last thing that we're gonna be doing today, just to be respectful of the timing there, is we're gonna add restrictions. I don't want this to go over the edges. Right now, it can go over the edges. So if I try, for example, to move it to the left or to the right or down, uh, not down because we cannot move down, but, um, it just like goes over. So we're gonna make here uh, one way of not allowing this thing to happen. So let's uh, let's do it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we don't want to allow it to go left or to go right more than the dimensions. So the first thing that we need to know here is the dimensions. So we're gonna create two uh, um, two static variables here, and I'll explain what they are to hold the width and the height of the board. So I'm gonna be creating a private static int width and the width is 10, we defined that in the beginning and a private static int height equals to 20. So what is the difference between creating it like this and like this? When we make it public, it means that we can change it from the editor. We saw there that when I select my uh, hero here, those things are visible. I can change them here. 
I, I should not be able to see the time count because it's something automated. So I can make this private. When I make this private, now I cannot change or see it in the inspector anymore. So that's the difference between public or private. So that's why those are private because I don't want to change them in the editor. They are fixed. They are inked, not float, because we don't have a grid that is like uh, half something, like 10.5 or something. They are 10 and 20, so int are fine. And what is the difference between being static or non-static? When we make it static like this, it belongs to all of the objects with the same value. So if I have 10 pieces, all of them have the same 10 and 20, and it cannot be changed. When we make it not static like this, I can change this value for each one of the instances. So every instance can have a different type um, fault time, every block, and they are in different time counts. And that's true because they fall in different times based on when they were instantiated. So basically, that's what uh, we're going to do here. That's why this is static and this is static as well, because we want to just use the same value across all of the objects in there. So now that we have our uh, our width and height, and they are defined in there. What we can do is basically check before our movement or before our object is moved, we can check if it could go there or not. So let's create a function. Right now, we have been using the start and the update function from Unity. So now we're going to create our own function. When we create a function, we need at least two things. One is, what is the type of the return of this function, like what it gives me back? When it's void, it means that it just executes stuff and doesn't give you anything back. Like this void just updates this, it does this, but it doesn't return any value. Um, our new function, it needs to tell me, can my block go there? Is it a valid move or not? So because of that, instead of being void, it's going to be a bool. So a bool is true or false. And I will give it a name. So I, I will call it valid false. And this is now our own function called valid false that returns a Boolean that can be true or false. Because it has a return value, Unity is going to complain that I need to return something. So I need to return either true or false based on the condition here. So my first condition is I need to know if any of my blocks, if any of the blocks, they are, uh, or um, I need to know if any of my blocks, they are going off the, the board. So because I have four blocks here, I need to check one by one. I need to check all of them if they're going uh, off, the, off the board. So basically, instead of checking, is the block one, is the block two, is the block three, or is the block uh, four, there is something in, in C Sharp called a for each. So basically, a for each is an instruction that just repeats based on a condition. So my condition here is going to be uh, transform uh, child in my transform. So what does this thing do? This is a for each statement. It basically repeats for every child in my transform does something. So this child is going to assume four values in four different iterations. So in the first one, first child, second one, second child until the end. So the good thing about it is if I have like five children or 10 children, it's going to work. It's going to repeat uh, as many times as we have children in this transform. So in the case of this guy here, it has one, two, three, four children. That's basically how it's going to go. So this child variable is going to be the transform of this guy, and then it's going to be the transform of this one, and then, and then it's going to be the transform of this one, and then the transform of this one. So now what I want to check is if any of them are outside of the boards in there or outside of the values in there. So the way I'm going to do is, is first, I'm going to get the X and the Y of this child, but I want to round it. So if there is like a glitch or if it is like in between uh, tiles, I make sure I'm rounding it. So I'm going to create here a variable rounded X. 
equals two. It could be just my uh, child dot transform dot position dot x. But as I mentioned, I want to um, to round it. So I'm going to use a mat f dot floor to eight. So what it's going to do is basically, if this value is 1.1, it becomes one. If it's 1.2, it also becomes one. Because uh, I want to transfer that to a grid position. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm considering that my grid only has uh, in integer positions like 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth. If for some reason I am in between those tiles, I'm going to just assume that I am in the nearest tile there. That's why I am rounding this uh, down. And I can do the same thing for Y. So I'm just going to duplicate this line. And this is going to be Y. So now I have the rounded position of X and Y. So even if my uh, X and Y here of one of those cubes, for example, here, this guy is minus 1.5. I am just rounding that back to one. So I know that it's in the one, uh, in the one position. That's basically what we're doing. That's why we are uh, rounding them. And now we just need to check if they are outside, uh, outside of the borders or not. So basically, I'm going to check if my rounded X is minus or is less than zero, it means that I'm going over the board to the left. I don't want it. Or this means or my rounded X is greater than or equals to my width. It means that I am passed to the right. I don't want that either. Or now with X uh, or with I. Uh, y. If my y is uh, less than zero, it means that I'm going over in the bottom, or my rounded y is greater than or equals to my height. It means that I'm going over in the top. So this could be in the same line. This doesn't make a difference. So for us to see better, I'm breaking that into two lines. So if any of those things happen, I will return false. So this basically means if I am going left more than I could or right more than I could or down or up more than I could, this is not a valid false. So it means that if any of my blocks are outside of the bounds, otherwise I just return true in the end here. So if I went over all of the blocks, none of them are outside of the bounds, it means that it's a valid move. So now I have two possibilities. I either return false or true. Could you use the parent name here to do something similar to determine if you cross person? You could, but that's going to be, you know what, in Tetris, uh, we are going to eventually destroy just some parts of the object. I can, for example, like clean a line and then this guy doesn't exist anymore. So in that case, it's going to stop work. So you could, but it's going to be a lot harder. It's easier to do that in individual blocks because you can have less blocks in the term points uh, throughout the game. So you could use this, but it's going to be a lot harder. Make sense? You are welcome. Nice. So now that we have this valid, um, uh, this valid pause, uh, we can basically use it. So using that, using that is going to be uh, quite easy. Basically, what we want to do here is while we are moving, um, we can uh, uh, check. We can check stuff. For example. Here, uh, we are moving down, right? Every time that this thing happens, we are basically moving down. So after we move, um, after we move down, we can basically check, was that a valid movement or not? So I'm going to check if 
it was a valid movement or a valid pause. We can do something. But actually, I want to say if it was not a valid movement. So this symbol here, it inverts the value of a Boolean. So if this returns true, now I'm checking if this is false. If it was false, now I'm checking if it's true. Another way of writing that is if this is equals to false. It looks better. Uh, it's easier to understand. So let's go with that. If valid pos is equals to false, meaning that it's not a valid pos, what do I do? I just translate that up again. So if I was translating that down and I made an invalid, uh, invalid movement, I just move that up. So now I'm moving down, moving down, moving down. Not a valid movement. Okay, move up once and that's it. So now I make sure it is in a valid movement. And we can do that for every single other movement as well. So I'm moving right. It was not a valid movement. So if uh, valid pause is not equals to true, or is equals to false, that's the same. What I do, I just translate that to the left. So I'm gonna translate that to the left. And here, same thing. It's moving left. If valid pause is equals to false, I just translate that to the right. So after every movement I check, was this a valid movement? No, we move that back. And that's basically it. So now let's test it. Now, if I try to move it to the right, it doesn't go. If I try to move it to the left, it doesn't go. And it should stop right in the bottom as well. And there we go. So it doesn't go below this position. If you check here, you can see that it is where it should be. Like in the perspective, sometimes it looks like it's down, but it's not. It's basically where it should be. All good. Um, my code isn't working. Could you please go to the left arrow key code? Sure. Left arrow. In which portion? Um, left arrow key code. Left arrow key code. Right arrow. Ah, here. Here? Cool. But yes, the video is going to be available, that's for sure. And you also are going to receive the project as well. So um, a burner space word doesn't exist in the context of code space world. Space dot world. Did you write that correctly? It should be space dot world. Hmm. Weird. Should exist, probably. Yeah, well, you can reach out on Slack and I can check the code with you. Probably something that you didn't open or close correctly there, but um, should be. Oh, did you find it? I messed up. Okay. <laughs> Usually that's how it goes. Cool. All right. So basically that's it. Uh, I, will, I will stop here because of the time. We already have here the, oops, not this. We already uh, have here the, the basis for you to start creating. 
So we know how to structure the blocks and how to create code in there. In the project that you're going to receive, there are a couple more features like cleaning the line, but they are basically derivation of the same um, of the same structure here. So I think what was the most important thing is go over uh, the coding concepts and how we organize them. So um, yeah, I hope it was useful. And if you want to keep building on top of that, I recommend that you do it, that you study the code. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to uh, help with, you can go on Slack and, and talk to me there. I can help you build other things. But this is basically the boilerplate. So from here, you can add as many other features as, as you want. But they are going to be all similar to this. So, so yeah, I'm going to wrap up here so we have time for the questions in the end. going to invite um, Tyler back just to wrap up. And I will be around. I will be around for for questions. So if we still have questions, it doesn't need to be about this project specifically. If you want to see more stuff, um, just hang in there. I'm gonna be. Uh, I'm gonna be back in a couple of minutes. Perfect. Um, well, awesome. Uh, I am back here now as well. Uh, thank you, Jerry. That was uh, awesome. Um, I'm sure uh, everybody that was uh, in attendance here was able to uh, learn quite a bit from that. Um, so we're uh, we're going to uh, open up the floor for any sort of uh, Q&A here in just a moment. Uh, so if anybody has any questions there, uh, please do go to the, uh, the question tab. Feel free to put it in. Uh, you can also type it uh, into the general um, chat uh, areas as well. You know, we'll, we'll make sure that we field anything. Uh, I did also drop the poll off to the right hand side there. Um, it's uh, a simple poll, just kind of a, a recommendation for people to attend the workshop. So uh, please go ahead and uh, feel free to submit a response for that. Uh, just helps us to uh, plan the next ones. Um, I'm just going to quickly kind of share my screen here. Uh, I'm going to hope that uh, my screen does not cut off on me. Jerry, if you are still watching right now, which you likely are, because you're going to come back in a minute. Uh, if my screen cuts off, feel free to pop in and say hi to everybody for just a quick moment. Um, but I am going to attempt to share my screen again, and we'll see if this works okay this time. Share. Yay, it worked. Awesome. So I'm just kind of picking up really quickly. I'm just going to go through a, a couple quick things here, guys, uh, just to give you some resources and uh, some information about the courses, about uh, everything that we have. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, is kind of going through the students' work, um, you know, whether it's uh, creating unique Unity scenes, um, you know, doing um, uh, experiences in uh, Vuforia with uh, AR or doing, uh, you know, like mind, mind blowing scripting experiences uh, with C Sharp. Um, it's, I find it really um, entertaining and, uh, uh, you know, uh, educational even to kind of go through and, and see what people are creating after they go through our course here. So uh, on the screen here now, um, you know, these are just a few examples of some of our students who've gone on to Carbo to Career in XR uh, after they've learned with us at CircuitStream. Um, I was going to touch uh, really quickly again on our uh, self-paced video course. Uh, this is the one I had noted uh, earlier. It, uh, I believe I did anyways, but it is a uh, six hour. You uh, purchase it directly through the website. You can just kind of go through it at your own pace. And the goal of this is to allow you to create your first um, AR app for your portfolio. Um, obviously we, we have more extensive, cor extensive courses uh, available afterwards if you were looking to further, but this is a really good way for uh, somebody brand new to um, you know see if they're uh, interested in AR development. Uh, the XR development with Unity course is um, one of our main courses here. Uh, it is completely beginner friendly. Uh, this is the 10 week course that's going to teach you to make AR and VR apps in Unity. Uh, you've got three hours of live instruction per week. Um, the office hours, five hours per week. Uh, we're flexible part time. Uh, you do get lifetime access to all of our material, all of our recordings. Uh, everything we do here in our in our courses is uh, portfolio based as well. So it's going to be project based. You're going to be doing actual app development uh, and you will have a handful of apps that you would have developed as a part of your portfolio once you've completed the course. Uh, and then the industry recognized certification, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we always have the uh, uh, option for one on one support in our uh, development and design courses. There's a package option there uh, for the development course, not through the universities, but directly through us as a company. Our upcoming cohort would be uh, February 15th. Um, and then in terms of the university partners here, uh, March 8th, uh, March 8th, um, sorry, I'll say the names of them, UBC, uh, University of Toronto, um, San Diego, uh, and California Riverside, they're all March 8th, 2022. 
Uh, and then the interaction design and prototyping for XR course. Uh, this is kind of the other side, you know, uh, people will often come to me and ask me, um, you know, what they'd be better suited for. Um, if you're interested in moving to XR uh, and you're not so much on the um, uh, coding and scripting side of things, then uh, likely the interaction design and prototyping might be a little bit of a better fit. Um, again, you're going to be designing experiences in AR, VR. Um, the structure of this course is uh, very similar to the development. Uh, in fact, they're, they're structured almost exactly the same in terms of three uh, hours of live instruction per week, uh, five office hours per week. Um, the industry recognized certifications. I did mention earlier, we're a certified training partner with Unity. So that would come with uh, both of these courses here. Um, and then this, oh, sorry, I will uh, uh, note uh, UBC, the next start date would be April 12th. Um, this is for the design course. Uh, uh, University of Toronto's design course would be April 11th. Um, we have San Diego uh, is going to be April 12th. And then uh, University of California Riverside is also April 12th. Uh, and then this one here is our uh, the new one that I had mentioned earlier. It is our uh, new Unity Developer Bootcamp. Um, the point of this course here, it's, uh, it's 24 weeks. Um, it is going to prepare you for 3D development career. Uh, it's going to teach you C-sharp coding logic. Um, you're going to actually build 10 plus projects, including your own idea. Uh, you get one-on-one -on -one career services, uh, industry-recognized industry certifications. Uh, and then we currently have over $100,000 in uh, scholarships available for students that are uh, looking at the course. Uh, March 7th would be our upcoming cohort date. Uh, we do have a bit of an interview process uh, for both the eligibility for the course and then also for the scholarship. Um, but if you are interested uh, in any of that, please do let uh, a member of the team here know. But we're happy to go over any of that sort of stuff with you anytime. Um, our certifications, very important to note. Um, so the bottom two here, you can see our interaction design and our XR development with Unity. Um, both of those courses, the 10 week courses would come with a certification that again is a uh, certified training partner with Unity uh, and it is industry recognized. You would either be an XR developer or an XR designer um, for the Unity developer bootcamp. We are going to uh, um, award our Unity Developer badge uh, straight through uh, CircuitStream, uh, but then we also include the associate level badge uh, straight through Unity. So uh, when you take the six month bootcamp, you can actually go a step level, uh, step further and um, uh, certify yourself through Unity Direct. Uh, it is important for me to note that all of our cert uh, uh, certifications are technically associated with Unity either way because we are a certified training partner. So. Um, now moving uh, on to the community and support, uh, we have a huge community here. I mean, we've uh, we've taught over forty thousand uh, students through our workshops and our courses, um, but uh, we've created a robust community of XR learners. Um, we have all of our students and our alumni, they all get lifetime access to our materials and our recordings, um, in addition to all the perks associated just with being in our community here. Um, our student experience coordinator, uh, Arcadius, uh, she's going to run all, sort of, uh, um, all sorts of uh, awesome events, um, you know, things that are dedicated to supporting our students and our alumni. Uh, she's going to facilitate extra office hours, support groups, demo days, uh, and much, much more. Um, the really cool thing about uh, our courses, I mean, the boot camp is a little bit specific because you do have to have a little bit of experience with Unity there. Uh, but generally speaking, our XR development and our interaction design courses are both uh, no experience required. Uh, so for beginners, uh, truly have no fear. I mean, a lot of people are nervous to jump in because they don't have any experience. Uh, and that's the beauty of these courses is you, you definitely don't have to have any experience to proceed. Um, now, uh, everyone's probably uh, curious about the tuition. So I'll kind of go over a few different options here. Um, on the screen right now, we have our starter and our plus packages. Um, this would be for both our development and our design courses. Um, the starter package uh, includes the course of your choice. Uh, the plus package also comes with an additional four weeks of C-sharp coding and scripting. Uh, and it comes with 10 private one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, each an hour long. So 10 hours uh, of private time with the instructor. Uh, you can jump off of the course curriculum a little bit in those times as well. Uh, if you have any sort of uh, individual um, app development ideas, um, you know you can get a little bit of a jump on those as you work through the course and actually get the education in the main course there. Uh, not shown on screen here, uh, the self-paced $50 um, um, AR course that I mentioned before. Uh, that one is uh, available right through our website for $50 if anybody did want to get started on that. Uh, and then in, in regards to our new uh, bootcamp here, uh, the pricing for new bootcamp is shown on screen. 
Uh, we are also offering a very large scholarship. Uh, it is available for just, you know, limited number of seats on the screen. It's kind of showing what's available uh, overall. Um, I'd have to double check or, you know, once you connect with the team here, we'd have to uh, see how many are currently available uh, at the time of the request. But um, this is the uh, the upfront course cost would be uh, $14,995. Uh, the scholarship here uh, would change um, uh, the price down or bring it down, I should say, to $7,955. Um, and I did mention before we have a bit of an interview process for both of those for the course and as well for the scholarship so uh, just let us know yeah if you have any questions we are happy to go over that uh, March 7th again would be the upcoming start date for that course uh, we do have finance plans as well. Uh, we have a little bit of an update on this, but um, generally speaking, uh, for any students uh, who are based in United States, American students, uh, we have a financial partner in the US called uh, CLIMB, uh, and we have an external loan set up uh, that is available. So you just have to go through, uh, make sure that you're eligible for the, uh, the finance plan um, and confirm your interest rates as you go through, uh, but it would be eligible for all applicants um, or you know, eligible if you have a co-borrower there. Um, and then uh, the other finance plans that would be available, I guess, for students outside of the United States, uh, international students, Canadian, um, you know, UK and anywhere else in the world, really. Uh, we uh, personally offer internal finance plans uh, that would be available ranging from three uh, to 12 months. So three, six and 12 months we can offer here. Um, so that's in terms of the, uh, the financing there. You can pay up front, but we do have those options. Uh, our admissions team, you can see us up on the screen. Again, I'm uh, in the middle there, but... Roham, Leanne, uh, Shoshana, Brandon, Marvell, uh, they're all working on the admissions team. They're all located, uh, you know, I think actually all of us here are specifically within North America in different areas. Um, but, you know, we're, we're kind of brought in from all different backgrounds uh, to, to be able to assist. So this just gives you a little bit of a visual of the uh, admissions team here other than just myself. Um, some website info. Um, this is the second last slide here, guys. Uh, um, website info. Uh, feel free to screenshot this if you want to take uh, any of the links or the URLs here. Uh, this is just basically going to be the download uh, syllabus or the apply now links uh, for UBC, UFT, UCR, USD, and then uh, CS at the bottom would just be directly through us at CircuitStream. Uh, so feel free. Again, this is recorded. This will be shared with you, so you don't have to. But if you want to screenshot it and uh, take note of any of these, you certainly can. Uh, and I'm just going to flip the screen here. Uh, and that is uh, basically it for the uh, actual presentation portion here. Uh, like I said earlier, we're going to open up the floor here. I'm going to um, invite uh, Jerry to uh, pop back on. I'm going to stop sharing this screen here. There we go. And Jerry is back up. Oh, sorry, my screen's telling me something. There we go. Uh, so we can uh, head over to the, the question side here. Um, and uh, welcome back there, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Awesome. Uh, and so are we going to get a copy of the tutorial emailed to us? Jerry is responding to that, but he's also nodding yes. So that is fine. Um, let's see. I see the team has launched a six-month course. Uh, is there any additional material uh, that wasn't already covered uh, in the XR development with Unity? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the course itself is going to cover uh, quite a bit outside. Uh, actually, you know what, rather than me even explaining it, Jerry's here. He's probably the very best person to kind of explain the difference there uh, between the two. So you can tell him a little bit about a boot camp. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think it's next week, but soon we have an open house. Where we're going to just talk about it and you can ask more specific questions about content. But yes, it's a lot longer and it's a lot more content there. So basically... The XR dev and the XR design, they are introductory courses. Like they're really great. People do amazing things, but they are like uh, intro, interest. They are 10 weeks long. So for the bootcamp, it is basically a professional development course. Basically, uh, someone that goes through is going to become a professional Unity developer. So it is a lot more focused on, on coding and best practices and teamwork. And uh, we have like career services uh, where we're going to help people with placement and finding jobs and and teaching and things like that. So it's a more comprehensive course, not only from the coding and Unity uh, perspective, but also from the career one. So yeah, it's it's completely different. It's it's um, more complete, um, long and thorough course in general. But I recommend if you're interested to, to join the, the open house just about it, because we're going to go over details and aspects and they're going to be more we're gonna uh, well yeah oh so dan is just helping there with the date it's uh 27th uh we're gonna um, talk about it specifically 
Ah, and so we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cover a lot more there. I mean, um, something for um, uh, a little bit of peace of mind for everybody. We have a pretty large internal network as well. Uh, we're just, you know, we're growing our connections uh, as we're connecting with more companies. We have people sending through, you know, tens, twenties to get trained. So there's going to be a lot more info, like I said, in the, uh, uh, the session there, but uh, we have a pretty robust network as it stands. So, um, and I think... Is that it? All I can see in terms of the questions off to the side here. I think you guys were kind of answering stuff. Um, uh, Jerry, you answered a ton as you were going through there in real time. So um, I think we might be okay. Uh, if anybody has any other questions that they want to pop up here, uh, we can. Oh, uh, somebody saying they still got that error there. Let me see. Yeah, I think it's this one. I can't figure out how to fix this error. Yeah. Uh, not all code returns a value. Okay, let me share my screen real quick here and show you something that might help you. Um, if it doesn't help, you can go over uh, the project that we share. But that uh, that error means that your valid post function is not returning uh, in all paths. So you need to have a return false uh, here. But if this doesn't happen, uh, it's not going to return anything. So probably that's your error there. You, I'm not sure if you forgot or added that to the wrong place, but you need to have this return true after the for each loop here. So basically, if you have a function that returns a value, whatever this value is, it needs to return in all paths. And this cannot be executed if we don't have children, for example, or if it's in a valid position. So if this is not executed, it's not going to return false. That's why you need to have a return true in the end. So that's probably... Um, what you missed there, this return tree in the end here. And I was just, uh, people were some, uh, people on the side were saying thank you. So I was just saying, no problem, you're welcome. Um, and yeah, if we have any other questions, um, Elias is thank uh, you, of course. It. Yeah, that was uh, it, cool, that was it, great. Yeah. So if anything else comes in here, guys, feel free to uh, reach out to us directly. Um, anybody on the admissions team, anybody here, we'll, we'll point you in the right direction for sure. Um, and I think outside of that, we're probably good to go. Um, so we can thank you again for uh, for joining the, the workshop today and uh, look out for our next one. Um, if you go to our website, circuitstream.com and click on the workshop tab at the top, it'll kind of let you know everything that we have coming up here. Uh, Jerry, did you have anything else before we uh, we let everyone go? I don't think so. Thanks everyone for joining. I uh, hope you have enjoyed and learned something. And yeah, hope to see you soon in other workshops too. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, look out for our next workshop and uh, have a great day. Have a great rest of, rest of your week. Bye-bye.